Bob, this is such a joy to do. I heard so many good things, especially from our friend Brad Gerstner before. But thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Not at all, but I heard from a little birdie that you started in radio at 15. Can you just talk to me? How did you start in radio at the tender age of 15? Well, I, w- I grew up in a very small town in Mississippi, and, uh, and I needed a job to pay for flying lessons. And I tried every place in town. I tried the men's clothing store. They said I was too young. I tried the high paying job in town, which was bagging groceries at the Piggly Wiggly. No <laughs> jobs. And I walked into this little radio station and uh, asking a guy named Bill Jones, who owned the station, if I could have a job. And he said, uh, he said, you know, uh, do you get you got good grades? I said, yeah, I'm pretty good grades. He said, you get in trouble? I go, not really. He goes, OK, come in this room. He put on a tape. He gave me some wire copy. Back in the days, all the wire came off teletype machines. He tore some off, said, read this. And a minute or so, he came back in and said, that's good enough. Uh, You're hired. And that began my career in radio. And back in those days, technology was such that there was no way to bring in signals from outside your market. So in little towns, they hired high school kids to be on the air. And it's (laughs) stunning the number of people who got their start doing that. Tom Brokaw, one of the great newscasters on NBC, started in Yankton, South Dakota as a as an on air disc jockey. So so it was a great way to get into the business. Can I ask, did you love it from the very first minute? Or was there a moment where you were like, this is what I really have a passion for? No. At first I loved airplanes. And this was a way to get there. What I did love is that I found all the kids in town would call me on the request line including girls, which age 15 is very important to you. Um, and uh, but it, but I, found, I actually began to fall into radio. And by the time I was sort of 17 or 18, I was just mesmerized by it. Can I ask, Bob, I always think careers have inflection points, big break moments where for some reason you're given more opportunity, chance than maybe one should at a young age. When you think back over your career, What would you isolate as a big break point in your career where you really scaled trajectory fast? Well, you know, I've had a lot of those, actually, but most of them were by accident. Um, I was uh, I was I mean, how did I go from being a 15 year old disc jockey in Brookhaven, Mississippi, to programming the NBC station in Chicago when I was 20 years old? At the moment, it didn't seem like that was so unusual. I look back and by the way, I went to program WNBC in New York, the flagship when I was 23. I go, how does that happen in an eight year period? So clearly there were some people along the way who really believed in me and gave me a shot. And and sadly, they gave me a shot. I might not give a kid. I might go, that's a kid. I can't give him a shot like that. Um, But uh, but why why do you think why do you think that is? Because I feel the same often. I'm like, I couldn't give a 21 year old loads of money to invest. I have no idea what they saw in me. And by the way, Charlie Warner, who's the guy who took me to Chicago and then took me to New York with him. Uh, is still alive. He's in his early 90s. And uh, and I've had this lifelong relationship with him. He worked for me for a while at AOL. Uh, and I've had him in other capacities. But it just he said, you just, wow, you just impressed me. You knew what you were talking about. And there was just something there. And that's why he did it. Um, but, you know, things happen. And then, you know, there are obviously other ones. I, I went to MTV because my great mentor at NBC at the time, Herb Schlosser, who is the president of NBC, got kicked upstairs and I thought my trajectory is over. So I went over to this cable company that was beginning to form a programming company called Warner MX Satellite Entertainment Corporation as their head of programming. But at that time, cable was nothing in the U.S. And everybody goes, why would you leave NBC to go this thing I can't even pronounce? Um, and so it's sort of dumb luck. And I went with Steve Case at AOL. I, I joined the board in 95. And then uh, Steve in 96, there were some issues going on. And Steve asked me if I would, you know, come down and and be the president and uh, and the board. And I was still on the board. And I sort of went as a lark, Um, did not see the great potential of it. And I came here to this company, which I've been at the longest of any place I've ever been. And I came in and as an investor originally in 2010. And I just thought, wow. This company has an asset no one appreciates. Audio is so underappreciated, undervalued. People don't know what it can really do. I do. And by the way, we're going to take it into digital. I didn't foresee podcasting, but obviously that was big for us, events, et cetera. And it just seemed like this great platform. And so I sort of took a chance on something that was a little crazy. And so we're gonna, we're- the big moves have always been when they didn't look like good moves. Actually, when I went to AOL, 
I had I, I was running Century Twenty One real estate after Time Warner and Six Flags theme parks, and uh, and my friends go, why would you leave Century Twenty One to go to AOL? That's how unappreciated the internet was, and how the potential of AOL was so underestimated. You said that multiple times, underappreciated. We're going to get to kind of your uh, insight into new markets. I do want to kind of start at the top, though, in terms of your leadership. I spoke to so many of your friends, your colleagues before the show, and stalked the shit out of you, really. Um, But my question to you is, when we think about leadership in particular, when I say the words high performance, what do they mean to you, having having led so many different organizations? Well, look, you know, I think the key is, at the end of the day, there's something we're trying to do. There's a goal, there's an objective. And I think it's just being religiously focused on that goal and objective and being sort of pretty open to any way to get there within reason and also to always do it as a team. Uh, I've never, ever been successful without a great team. And so for me, I'm constantly looking around, who are the people I wanna be in the foxhole with? Who can do stuff I can't do? Uh, and by the way, if they've got a big weakness, as long as somebody else on the team can cover the weakness, who cares? We're looking for that combination of people who gel as a team, work as a team, respect each other as a team. And, uh, and I've never seen, by the way, big success without it. Bob, you said about team there. I spoke to someone kind of on your team. Um, I normally have references with other VCs or founders. When when we were doing the prep for the show, you gave me Ryan Seacrest. I mean, Bob, that's pretty cool. I mean, I appreciate that a lot. And we had a chat yesterday. And Ryan said specifically, Bob has the ability to forecast things that are marketable before they're on the horizon. And so going back to that, people didn't see or appreciate what you did. I want to understand, how do you gain an instinct for where the world is going ahead of the world? You know, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't think I do. I think what I am is I'm wildly observant. I'm wildly curious. I spend a lot of time listening to a lot of people. And my ears perk up when something, something catches my ear. And I go, well, that's sort of interesting insight. And to me, I think we're looking constantly, if you're, if you're a leader or you're running a company, you're constantly looking for the unique insights and the epiphanies. Most of the stuff we do day to day does nothing except to keep the trains running. But to keep the business growing, we've got to find those, wow, there's something going on here. And that's what I'm constantly in search of. And by the way, it, it matches my skill set and my interests because I'm wildly curious. I sort of curious about everything in life. So and when I spot that stuff, I'm, I dig in and I I'm, I'm ask a lot of questions. I want to know. I want people to educate me. But I don't think I'm seeing something that's unknown. I think I'm seeing the first glimmer of something and, uh, and saying, wait a minute, this is what's happening. And then I usually try and figure out why, because I, I don't want to chase it if I can't figure out why is that happening. But if I can say that's happening, then I go, and now I know why it's happening then I feel much better sort of turning the team toward that. I, I do want to go to an example, but just first, my question to you that I struggle with here is, naturally, when we're so ingrained in work, we surround ourselves with the same people. Often the people are quite similar in many ways. They all love media. They all love venture capital. All, and you don't get a diverse set of opinion. And so that unique insight is often quite common thought because the people and their backgrounds are all the same. How do you think about ensuring that you do actually get the consumer's insights, right. not just execs in media or media talents. Well, there are, there, there are several layers of that. One is if everybody agrees on something, it's a bad idea because that's group think and that's media. If it's in the headlines, I'm not going there. There's no upside in that. Uh, the opportunity is to find something that everybody's not doing. And, um, and I also think there, there, there are management styles. I build a team not of people like me. I've already got me. We need people who are not like me and that are disparate people, but still have enough chemistry to hold together as a team. And we have a couple of things. Look, we, we worship dissent. I want to hear where people disagree. When people throw up an idea and say, we worked this out and this is what we're going to do. I say, what did the dissenters say? First time I mentioned that to people, they go, oh, no, we all agree. And I go, well, then you hadn't really dug in enough because there's always a dissenting point of view and we need to look at it and examine it. And and the example I use is John Kennedy. When he announced he was going to put a man on the moon in the early 60s, he had not told NASA. 
It was 100 percent a political announcement. And NASA hears about it on the news. Well, as you can imagine, they go batshit. Uh, the, the people from the White House go over and meet with them. And what they did next was really, really change the course of not only space program, but management in the U.S. is they said, well, why can't we put a man on the moon? And they start listing out no rocket fuel, navigation, no heat shield, blah, blah. They go through this whole exhaustive list. Anything else? That's it. So what you're telling me, as soon as we solve these problems, we put a man on the moon. And they built these teams of people, not general to a private, but people of equal rank. And they just made somebody a team leader. And these teams worked on each one of those problems. And they put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And I find the same is true in business, that if we listen to the dissent, what they're really not, not personal say, like, I hate it. That's not very good dissent. But that's not going to work because of X, Y and Z. The, we need to examine the X, Y and Z and figure out, hmm, we need to make sure we solve X, Y, and Z to make this a successful idea. And the dissenters become very important in my process. And, and I think the other thing we do is we also don't expect uh, everything to be perfect. I could, if you're a genius, maybe you get it right 50% of the time. You're going to get it right. We're going to get it wrong most of the time. So just be ready for it. And if you're going to get it wrong most of the time, then what kind of what goes along with that? And what goes along with that is quick decisions, because when you get it wrong, admit it, you made it wrong and change it and change it quickly. And when you change it quickly, you the damage of getting it wrong doesn't really hurt. And it iterates till you keep trying until you get a better chance of getting it right. And uh, and I think one of the problems, too. And so we have quick decisions. We said we sort of have a half serious rule that we have a 24 hour rule. The problem I have is if you ask people, when will you have this decision ready for me? It'll be a long time out. So I always start with, we need it in 24 hours. And I make people justify why they can't do it in 24 hours, which tends to pull decisions in uh, by putting that construct on it. And when you push that sense of urgency on it, and we also say no study and review, uh, you're, you know, people often say, I say, when are you going to make that decision? I say, well, we're going to decide next week. And I go, what are you going to know between now and next week? You don't know right now. And if, if you're not going to know something important in that period of time, why don't you just make the decision right now? So probably the reason you're putting it off till next week is it's a hard decision, but time doesn't help hard decisions. As a matter of fact, it often hurts them. Um, so let's make a quick decision and keep going. The third thing I'd look at is that when we make decisions, these, I'm making these numbers up. Let's say we're making 10 decisions. Two, I'm going to make this up, are clear winners. We just go, wow, that worked. That was great. Exactly what we expected. Two are clear losers. Wow, those are stinkers. Get rid of them. The problem is I got six in between. What do I do with those? The ones that were they go, well, it didn't do exactly what we wanted to, but it's helping. It's got something that they always start looking at the good in it. And the decision I always say was, well, if we had said our goal is what it's doing, would we have done this? The answer is almost always no, but it's doing something good. I think the real courageous people kill everything that's not a clear winner. Most people can only kill things that are clear losers. So you figure if there's two on top, two on the bottom and six in between, imagine what happens to a company if you let everything live that that's gunk in between a clear winner and a clear loser. We call it weeding the garden. So I think, and by the way, and I'm as guilty as everyone else of justifying why something happens. But when we have excruciating honesty at, with each other, we can say that's not working, even though you fell in love with it, even though you're trying to justify it, get rid of it. And I think those three things in terms of a management technique help us. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, there was so many things I was writing uh, <laughs> to, to make sure that I can remember. Uh, you mentioned that about kind of you know, killing things that maybe aren't working or kind of are in between. We're both in the content game. It took me... 200 episodes before we got 2,000 plays per show um, and no money. And now we get, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions in some cases. Um, but this is eight years in. How do you think about that? Like kill things that aren't material and sizable in longer oh, term. I'm not saying kill something that's not sizable or material because I think you kill. There are many things that aren't sizable or material, but will be. I think what you kill are things that aren't doing what you initially said. I started tequila with my good friend, Berto Gonzalez, back in 2000, launched in 2009. 
We deliberately said, let's take a long time. Let's let people, this is going to be a product people discover. So the goal was not to have instant. We weren't pushing to have 100,000 cases in the first two years. We built a plan to allow it to breathe. So I think, you know, especially when you're doing content, that what you're really saying is, I'm going to build this show to reach these people. And then you're probably going to say, okay, you got, let's say, 2,000 downloads. Are those 2,000 the right people? Yeah. And do those 2,000 people like it? And if you say, yeah, those are the right people and they do like it, they say, okay, then our issue scale. Now we go from we did a show, but now how do we scale it? Or they say they liked it, but they didn't like it because of X, Y, and Z. Okay, I'll change, I'll adjust that. Um, I make, I, I think, you know, the, the back and forth dialogue is so important with the consumer, but it's, it's also important in terms of what's my goal and am I hitting my goal? And part of it is you can't have unrealistic goals. Like if you launch something and you say, I'm going to have 200,000 downloads to the episode, well, that's probably a stupid goal. Uh, unless you have some secret sauce, like you've got 10 million social followers or you've got $10 million in advertising you're put behind it, or somebody's going to cross promote you on another hit. So there are ways to do it, but I think it's a matter of understanding realistically what you're trying to do. And sometimes it starts, by the way, sometimes you can start big and say, wow, I got a million downloads and you go, yeah, but you know what? The people don't like it. Um, they don't look like they're going to come back. The show stinks. We can't sell advertising in it. Get rid of it. So there is no, things aren't a success or failure based on big numbers, success or failure based on what you're trying to do. And part of it is precisely know what you're trying to do. When should you change your goal? Well, you know, I, I think when you change your goals, when you're ready to change your business. Um, I find I use a process in budgeting called GHOST which is goals, objectives, flowing to strategy, and then tactics. And I, you know, so I think you sort of start with what are we trying to accomplish here? Um, and then you'll have some strategies to do that. And then you'll develop your tactics. Your tactics are your operating plan. And those will usually be your key KPIs. And I find over the years, my goal rarely changes. My objectives change sort of year to year because that's how I'm going to, you know, have a million dollars of revenue or two million dollars or ten million dollars. And, you know, there are, there are external factors that affect some of that. But the strategy to get there is almost always the same. What changes radically are tactics and tactics change day to day. And I think that the key in, in a business is focus on uh, on those tactical solutions if you have the right goals and strategies. But if you're having to change your goals and strategy, you probably don't have a good plan and you probably don't have a good business. Can I ask you, what's the difference between a goal and an objective? They seem the same to me. A goal is what am I trying to do? I'm trying to give everyone in America a friend anytime, anywhere using my, is there more your mission statement? Or by the way, we're going to make, in the case of AOL, we're going to make the internet as essential to people, as important to people as their telephone or television. Those are the goals, big, real goals. The objective is, okay, and we'll make $10 million this year and $12 million the next year, and we'll do a profit of $2 million this year. So no, there's a quantifiable output of the goal. And then the strategy is how we're going to get there. I totally get you. Can I ask then, why I listened to you on Mini and Mini Driver talk, and I loved it. But you said, like, having a plan, never have a plan. Um, and it kind of flies in the face of almost ghosts, which I love, but I'm going, huh, are they counterintuitive? Yeah, and, why and, do and, look, and, and it depends on what we're calling a plan. I think some people have a plan for their life, a plan of what they're going to do. That plan's never going to come true. Even when we're talking about this ghost, the plan is sort of the tactical level. Uh -huh. Since I was at MTV, I've had a weekly operating committee meeting. Senior most exec executives get together. Why? Because we have to change the plan every week because things don't turn out as planned. And uh, I can't tell you over the years how many people I've offered a job to, and they said, I can't take it because I got a plan of what I'm <laughs> gonna do. Almost to the person those people come and say, boy, I wish I'd taken that job, my plan didn't come true. <laughs> that I think plans are something we do to reduce anxiety about the future, because it's always, it's a little, it takes your breath away a bit to say, I don't, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I don't know what I'm going to do in five years. I don't know what I'm going to do in 10 years. I mean, none of us ever got married thinking I'm going to get married and then I'll get a divorce. Um, we had a plan of a life together. 
things don't always work out. We take a job. We say, I'm going to stay at this job for 10 years. You may stay at the job six months or you may, in the case of AOL, I told Steve, I'll come down and help out for a year. So I stayed like seven or eight years. Um, that plans are not the reality. Now, when we're talking about a, a company, the operating plan is what is that thing we're operating from? And, uh, and I think when we call it the plan, you better be prepared to change it and change it often. Uh, because nothing, I don't think we go a week without changing the plan because there's something that's better, something that's worse and, uh, or some external variable has sort of shifted the world and, uh, and you got to take it into account. I love that in terms of hiring people and then then coming back to you saying it didn't go to plan. Um, when, even when you're hiring people or when you're, you know, addressing consumer product adoption, messaging and storytelling is, is so crucial. Uh, I spoke to so many and they said you are the best in the business when it comes to kind of packaging and messaging, especially around consumer products. And so I just want to kind of open up with a broad question of how do you think about what makes great messaging, Bob, and what is great storytelling to you? I, you know, I know I'm a Southerner. And Mississippi had great storytellers. And I had a bunch of uncles who were great storytellers. And the family was always about storytelling. So I think that part is sort of you culturally come to it or genetically come to it. Um, But I think what makes a great story is what is interesting to people? What's the sort of sense of tension or discovery in that? What makes it exciting? And whenever I develop messaging, I use I have a podcast called Math and Magic because it's sort of what I live by, that I think there's the math of marketing, which is who are the people, what are they like, what are they looking for? And then once I know that, that doesn't make it interesting. I just sort of know where they are. Now I have to have magic. I've got to have something that sort of brings them in and captures their imagination. And a lot of the messaging is what's the attitude, what's the mood? What is the image I'm trying to convey? Uh, at MTV, we were trying to convey the image of we were not TV. We were throwing TV out. We were spitting on TV. We're the new TV. We're the rebellion. So everything had to reflect that kind of attitude. And I've been, you know, we all have a personality type. And I'm probably much more of an empath. Uh, I lost an eye when I was six years old, have an artificial eye. You can imagine as a kid, you're the outsider, you're the kid with the glass eye. So being an outsider is great because what the outsider does is I learn to read people. I learn to watch people. And by the way, I was a skinny little kid in a bullying old South uh, and I have one eye. And, and we moved two or three times during my childhood, which really makes you an outsider again. But I learned to just watch people and listen to people and think about. So what I think and you say, what's an innate skill I have? I have a pretty good skill of saying, oh, that's a cringeworthy message or oh, that's a cool way to say it. Um, and sometimes I come up with the line. Sometimes I don't come up with the line, but I'm a really good editor. When I hear the line, I go, that's the line. Let's go with that. And uh, and there's not a lot of indecision. There's not a lot of hand wringing. I worked for a guy named Henry Silverman once, who's a great pal and great thinker. And Henry always talked about study and review is the greatest insult. We're not study and review people. Just make the damn decision. And, and I think in the creative process of messaging, it can't be committee decision. It's there's a keeper of the vision of every product. Uh, when I was at MTV, I was the keeper of the vision. I was not saying, is this a good idea, a bad idea? I'm saying, did it fit MTV or not? It's a great editor. When Graydon Carter edited Vanity Fair, he wasn't making decision about this a great article or bad article. He said, this fits in this issue of Vanity Fair. It's the, the vision of what's going on. When, and when we had Nickelodeon, the keeper of the vision of Nickelodeon was Jerry Laybourne in my day. That there's always the keeper of the vision. And I always step in as sort of, you know, if it's not obvious, I'll make the decision about what we're trying to do. Um, I did a podcast, Math and Magic, with one of the guys that did the on-air look for me, Fred Seibert. And Fred is a brilliant guy. And he talks about how we came up with this idea of the look of MTV. And we're sort of pushing. And I sort of told him this sort of outlandish, radical idea of what a, a logo could be and what our animation would go. go. OK, great. I'm there. I'm with you. That, you know, you'd say a couple of things and people begin to frame what it is and understand it. And I think that's important in a message. But I usually start with, is there something I can say that's so important that you that that alone will sell it? Like instead of four clicks, it's one click. Oh, I like that. Uh, or I'll send it to you in the mail or I'll deliver it tomorrow. Uh, something that's radically different from what you have today. 
if you've got something like that, say it. If it's more subtle, you have to convey it with messaging, with sort of image and, and, and concept. And I think that's what you, you sort of wrestle with. And, you know, the creative process often works. The people, I think, that do it best. And, and by, by the way, David Eagleman says this is sort of the way the, the brain works. Sort of my one of my favorite books. And and, you know, you sort of look at everything you need to know. You think about it, you feel your head full, and then you forget about it. And you let your subconscious do the work. And then one day when you're in your most meditative state, mine happens to be a 15-minute hot shower in the morning, suddenly I go, God, I got it. Where did that come from? And I've got the answer. And your subconscious has been ruminating and working it. And almost everyone I know who does is in the creative side of the business. Their, their decisions come to them like that. And uh, so I think that's sort of tee it up and be that way. And don't think there's an MBA approach to and we're going to rigorously develop the message because I rarely happens that way. Can I ask, Bob, have you ever got the messaging wrong? Have you ever embraced a project, done the messaging and it's just flopped? And, and did you learn anything from that? You know, I must have. But mine is I don't ever think I'm there. I think we're always moving. So whatever was wrong is just the reason to do more. Um, I, I, I talk with my kids about decision making and failures and successes, which they're in their early 20s, which it means my younger kids, which, you know, that's very important in, in that stage. And I think a failure and a success is exactly the same thing. It's a stepping stone. What we call a failure is one of the stepping stones we make a turn on. We go left or right. And a success is one we go forward. But all of them are just stepping stones. We're constantly moving. Nothing ever gets there. It's not finished. Uh, and when you think about it, it's just constantly moving and it's a journey. Then you don't keep track of them. People say, well, you had a great failure. I go, I don't know. I don't keep track of them. I don't keep track of if I don't have a ledger of failures and successes. It's just all a process to try and get to the right place. And by the way, what's the right place today? It could be the right place tomorrow. When I was at MTV, we used to have the, you know, Neil Armstrong landing on the moon, planting the flag and we were originally going to have one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And then Neil Armstrong said we couldn't use his voice, so we never had the voice. And then when the space shuttle came out, we changed it. And we did this. We changed the animation to being the space shuttle taking off and the space shuttle delivering the MTV satellite. And it was great. And then Challenger blew up. Um, so we go, whoops, wrong icon, wrong. It's so, you know, external factors can come into play, which change what you're doing. That was obviously a radical example. Can you talk to me about, I, I love that in terms of successes and failures being the same. Uh, <laughs> on that note, um, I spoke to Joe from Human, um, who actually mentioned, you know, obviously you both owning tequila brands, but he said one of his favorite memories from you know, your relationship is when you told him about how you marketed Six Flags against Disneyland. And he said, I had to ask this. So how did you market Six Flags against Disneyland, which was a competitor for context? How did you market it? And what did that teach you? It actually, Disney was not a competitor, huh. but I used them to market Six Flags. That Six Flags were regional theme parks. I had seven of them around the country at the time. 80% of America lived within a day drive of one of the parks, but they were parks that people come out to for the day. Disney was a destination park. People would go there for three days, a week, whatever, and they would stay there. But Disney was, in terms of theme parks, it was sort of Disney and then all these regional theme parks. And part of the problem was, and I sort of thought about the cola stuff, you know, when Pepsi did the Pepsi challenge against Coke, they weren't trying to compete with Coke. They were trying to get away from all these others. They wanted to be the other ones. So I said, you know what? Disney's that. I want to get in the Disney category and be a crummy Disney. That's a win. So if people say, you know, say, what do you think of Six Flags? Well, you're not as good as Disney. I win. If they say you're much better than Dorney Park, I lose because they've got me in the wrong category. So it's like, you know, Pepsi, they say, wow, you're a lot better than Hojo Cola. Uh, Pepsi would not think that was very good. If they say you're not quite as good as Coke, they go, great, I'm in the right category. So I wanted to use Disney to get in the in the category of Disney. So I would get that halo of Disney on Six Flags. And then we also, we managed to sell it as what could be the advantage of a day trip versus the, the vacation. What we knew from the research was that dads are stingy bastards and they're <laughs> selfish as hell. 
and they only want to do what they want to do. Moms always look to the kids and say, what do kids want to do? That's what I want to do, what the kids want to do. So we had to make sure. So we began to play a little bit to dad. So we said, you know, uh, you can go, come to Six Flags and you can come for the day. Uh, you can be home in time to feed the dog. Uh, we began to say, and so the dads go, oh, this is great. I can just take them out to Six Flags for a day and I don't have to freaking fly to Orlando for a week. Um, so it began to be a way also to begin to position it as, and there's one thing that really matters in all consumer products, which is convenience. We managed convenience. You don't have to get on a plane and go somewhere. You can just go out for the day and come back. That's more convenient. And convenient always has a huge advantage in any consumer decision. I'm just trying to like think. So I totally get that in terms of. And by the way, our line was bigger than Disneyland, closer to home. Um, so we played the convenience angle of closer to home and tied to Disney with the bigger than Disneyland. I mean, we're just looking for an excuse to hang on. By the way, we did sort of the same thing at six at, at AOL. We were uh, so easy to use. No wonder it's number one. Um, so again, we're like size wise, everybody always likes number one, but if you say I'm number one, you sound like you're bragging. So you have to have a reason to mention that you're number one. And then easy was the winning strategy. But the, at the time you were early talking about group think the group think was AOL is the internet with training wheels. It's not sophisticated. It's not really the internet. That's not what consumers thought. That's what the tech industry thought. And uh, the consumer said, "Ooh, this is very complicated. Make it easy. So we did spots with kids saying, it's so easy. Even my dad can do it. He was saying, that's none of that computer mumbo jumbo. And we were all about easy. And we weren't the best. We weren't the whatever, but we were the easiest. And we owned easy. And in my day and Steve Case's day at AOL, half of the traffic of the Internet came through AOL in the U.S. So it was a smashing success. But again, in terms of the marketing, sort of similar thing, you know, play to what you know about the product. Can I ask, does human psychology change around messaging, do you think? Easy, you mentioned there, stingy bastard dad's cost. Easy and cost today, isn't that what 90% of great brands today are built on? I'm going to tell you, I, I've only done consumer services business. I never do B2B. Uh, and I will tell you the one thing that all only one thing matters, convenience. When I was at AOL, we described AOL to the business community as convenience in a box. What we were in the business of doing is taking everything you did in your life and make it easier by doing it on the computer. And, uh, and, and, and it's interesting. The one thing I really got wrong was I said, yes, I know it's more convenient to look at something on the phone, but people are going to want those big screen TVs. You know, years later, I see my kids sitting in front of a big screen TV turned off looking at their laptop or looking at their phone, <laughs> watching a TV show. Convenience beats quality. And, and, and it's, you hate to say that loudly because people think I'm a, I'm a horrible guy and don't like quality. I appreciate quality. But if quality won, everyone would still have a wired line instead of a mobile phone because the quality is a lot better. They would have never used the microwave oven because the conventional oven cooks so much better. Uh, but convenience is the winner, not quality. And when you understand that, then you can just bake everything down to is more convenient. We were talking to engineers at, at AOL in those days. Sometimes they come in and say, man, we got a great new feature. And you say, is it one less click? They go, no, it's one more click. I said, I don't want to hear it. If it's not one less click, it's not more convenient. And no, nothing you can say about quality is going to justify more uh, uh, clicks, less convenience. The question I have subsequently, does convenience always equal a great business? And I think about like Getty or you have in the US GoPuff, fantastic convenience service delivering yeah. groceries to your door. Amazing, respectfully, and you know, there's no argument on this. Margins are really hard. It's a really hard business. Probably not a good business, respectfully, again. It does convenience always lead to good business? No, no. And by the way, great products don't lead to a great business. Uh, you have to have a business model. And, uh, you know, I mean, there are even questions about, I mean, Spotify, great product. People love it. Is it nothing more than a retailer that the, all the money's going to the record companies and they're just letting Spotify have just enough margin to stay in business? Is it a great business? Um, I mean, you look at all these delivery services, I can't imagine 
those are a business. Uh, maybe one day it will be. Maybe a smaller subset of the consumers will be willing to make, pay more money. So have fewer consumers paying more money. And maybe that's a business. But, you know, I, I'm always um, when you talk about businesses, I always want to see it on an envelope. Like if you can't show me on the back of an envelope how this about three or four lines equal the business, I don't think you've got one. And we go through periods in probably the world, certainly in America, where we build up this bunch of things that aren't based on it's going to earn money. And it's going to get a lot of in the, in the 90s, it's going to get a lot of eyeballs. Uh, then it's going to get a lot of traffic. Then it's going to get a lot of, of revenue. Uh, but at the end of the day, all those are IOUs to the investment community for earnings. Because when you're saying it implicitly, you're saying one day that will turn into earnings. But if it's not going to turn into earnings, you don't have a business. Can I be really direct and ask if you were to do those three to four lines on iHeart, just so I get an understanding for what sort of thing that would look like, what would you say the three to four lines on iHeart is? No, the iHeart is revenue minus expenses equals a bottom line, a EBITDA, our earnings. And then I take it one step further and say, how's our free cash flow? And what else did I invest? And how did I use the cash? And how much do I have left? Um, and to me, I think every business ultimately boils down to free cash flow. And for me, I'm always looking at, OK, and if I'm going in a new line of business, what's the margin going to be on that? We've we've done the podcasting business in the U.S., which was an adjacent business to radio in my mind. And we are now uh, the size of the next two podcast publishers combined. And we prime. So we got the more more downloads than anyone else by a mile. We've also got more revenue than everybody. But what we really have is we're probably the only podcaster that has real profits. And we may be 20 or 25 percent of the revenue of the podcast business. I'll bet we're probably 90 percent of the profits of the podcast business because we refuse to do deals that aren't profitable. And there are plenty of people go, we got to get in and we'll buy our way in. You don't buy your way in by doing unprofitable business. It never gets profitable, Um, you know. You may buy your way in because, as you pointed out, you'll start small and do 2000 to 5000 to 10000 But you know when you hit $20,000, you will make money. Or when you hit 50000 and you can see a sure path to get there. But it, for us, we I, I just always demand that things are really profitable. I don't believe in phony stuff. Uh, and there are times in my life in which I'm out of phase with the world because there's great value in businesses that are never going to make any money. But I've never seen it last. And I think the lasting part is the is the key. I, I totally get you. Can I ask, when you think about the business that you have today, how do you think about the split between like, you know, original content that you, you own and package yourself and it's pure iHeart versus that which you buy? And the ones you own, like, how do you think about the different economics between the two? I'm fascinated as a podcast. Well, there, 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 there are several there are gradations of that. Um, you know, we start on the radio and we really don't have content in terms of shows, we really have, we're keeping people company. We're companionship. And by the way, we're, I would argue we're that in podcasting as well. It's very host driven, just like radio. And what people are really doing is they got a friend to hang out with. It's like people say, oh, aren't you competing with Spotify? Because Spotify is not even close to being a competitor. Spotify replaced Apple downloads, which replaced CDs, which replaced cassette tapes, um, that, that there's always a symbiosis. I listen to my music collection when I want to escape the world. I listen to radio when I hear what's going on in the world. By the way, 70, 80% of Spotify, Pandora, et cetera, listeners, the main way they discover new music is FM radio. Uh, these are their pals. That's Ryan Seacrest. They ride to work with every day. Uh, it's Steve Harvey. It's uh, Charlemagne the God. It's Elvis Duran. It's Bobby Bones. It's these friends they have, Ellen Kay, that they know and trust. And so that's the business we're in. When we go to podcasting, and so by the way, on the radio, we have all variations of deals. We have some people who make probably union minimum wage, and we have people who make fortunes uh, on the air. Some of them are guaranteed, some of more revenue split. We're sort of look at any deal that economically makes sense and works with them. And when we go to podcasting, we're sort of the same thing. Some of our podcasts we come up with the idea, we produce it in-house, and somebody just voices it. Well, I'm math and magic. We have no profit participation. They don't pay me anything. Um, and then you've got some that go up, but we refuse to do one where anybody makes so much money, there's nothing left for us. And we also say, what do we contribute to it? What we contribute is we can get traffic for podcast 
hit podcasts more than most people can because our radio group alone reaches 90% of Americans every month. Only two companies come close to that and they don't surpass it's Facebook and Google. Everybody else, the biggest TV network in the U.S. reaches about 35% of Americans. Biggest cable network reaches less than 20%. Spotify, Pandora, Sirius, XM reach less than 20% of America. Uh, so we've got this huge asset of this 90% reach. We advertise podcasts on the radio and make them a hit if they can be. I mean, you can't make something not a hit a hit. But if it's going to be a hit but four people can't find it, we can solve the problem. We also have so many hit podcasts that we can cross promote with the other podcast. Um, we can take, we have 270 million social followers to iHeart and all of our products and brands and people. So we can push it through that as well. When we do the iHeart Music Awards, we get twice, twice the social impressions of the Super Bowl or the Grammys. Uh, people talk because it's back and forth. That's what people are doing with us. They think it's a friend. They think they're talking with us. So we can make podcasts. And the other thing we can do is we can monetize. We have the biggest uh, uh, audio sales force. We have about 1,500 sellers. We have now with Triton and some of the other pieces we have, we have this terrific ad tech platform as well. So we, and by the way, we do about four times as much ad revenue as the next largest audio player uh, in audio ad revenue. So we're able to plug people in that system and maximize it. So it gives us an advantage. And because we're so big, almost everybody's got a great idea comes to us first. The ones we don't take are the ones that aren't economic. Um, and so by definition, the other folks are getting, as you go down the list, the less and less economic deals. And I'm just, I think when you're the leader, what you don't do is you don't cave on economics. It's either a business or it's not a business. You can love the idea, you can love the people, but if there's no economics, then I go, that's great, but it's not for us. Can I ask, do you see an 80-20 distribution in the revenue generated on a podcast basis? The hits Meaning what? Meaning that the 20% of hits produce 80% oh, of the revenue. it's probably more than that. It's probably, you know, given how many podcasts there are today, it's got to be one ninety nine um, For you, though? Within iHeart? Oh, no, not within iHeart. Within iHeart, we're hundreds of podcasts. And, you know, maybe it is 80, 20 or 10, 90. But the big ones always make most of them. Maybe the same is true on radio, too. Our biggest stations, our biggest talent make a outsized uh, proportion of our, of our overall ad revenue. Can I ask what worries you about the podcast industry? I think when I look forward, especially over the next 24 months, Bunny, I'm worried about a macro recession impacting podcast, uh, sorry, advertiser sensitivity towards marketing budgets. Um, for me as a media company owner, that's n unnerving. Uh, how, what are you worried about? And would you share my concern there? No, look, I think podcasting is, of all the businesses we have, is the least affected by the macro because it has such a fundamental strength. It's growing. It's growing like crazy. Huge engagement on podcasting. Yeah. People are absolutely listening to or hanging on every word. You know, when people are watching a TV commercial, most of it's like second or third screen. Mm -hmm. They don't know what's going on there. They got something in the lab. They're doing their email. They're doing something else. When they're running and they're listening to something, they're actually listening. When they're in the car and they're driving by themselves, they're listening. Uh, they don't have a second screen going on. And so, and, and podcasting is sort of that on steroids. And so I think the impact podcast has, the, the, the idea that the audience is just ballooning, and also it's the desirable audience. You know, podcast, talk radio tends to be older. Huh. Podcasting tends to be younger. Yeah. Um, so you've got this young interested, engaged audience that you can activate and will act. So I think podcasting is just, I, I, you know, if you can say, what's your list of 10 things to worry about? Podcasting is not on that list. What is number one? The macro. I mean, how much money are people going to spend on advertising? And uh, are they going to pull back? And, and, it's, it, it, and by the way, clearly everyone said, you know, what began as a very robust year, we've said our earnings call has turned out to not be so robust. But it's probably doing better than we expected. And the question you ask yourself was, why is it doing better than we expected? And I think there, the reason is that we just had a downturn two years ago. Normally, it's about 10 years between downturns. And the people making the ad decision have forgotten all the lessons from the last one. And the most important lesson to learn is, and you learn it the hard way, is if you cut back during, the, and, uh, during an ad recession, you, when you want to restart after it, it costs you more money than if you kept advertising through it. 
And uh, there was a study done during the last uh, in the pandemic that I, and I may have my numbers wrong, but is directionally right. Companies that cut back their advertising saw about a 17 percent drop in in sales. Companies that advertised through the pandemic saw about a 17 or 18 percent increase in sales. Huge delta. And I and I talk to people say, God, I wish I just kept going. You know how expensive it is to try and capture that customer back that I lost because I didn't advertise or worse, my competitor advertised and got them. And I've got to try and fight them and and win them again. And so the people, because it was two years ago, the people making the ad decisions today are the same people who made the ad decisions then. So if this is fresh in their mind, and I think that's why we're seeing a moderating effect in terms of, of an ad downturn. I could be, by the way, I could be completely wrong. Maybe the same thing fall off a cliff somewhere. But I am, uh, I think that's what's going on. And, um, and, and, I, and I'm sort of fascinated by it. You know, you talked earlier about human nature. Hmm. I think human nature go- governs everything. You know, just bet on human nature every time. And human nature is if you've had a recent painful experience, you will learn something from it. If it was really long ago or it was a lesson in the history books, you didn't learn any lessons. Can I ask, uh, two, you mentioned two things which make me feel very insecure. One is like an unknown about advertiser willingness to pay. As I said, run a business that relies on it. And number two is not really seeing it before. You said about the ad recession two years ago. Respectfully, I didn't really feel that. It was short. It was, for me, it was short. It was brief. Didn't feel that. Oh, eight. Podcasting, our podcasting business and our digital. If I looked at numbers, I wouldn't have known there was a recession. Traditional <laughs> advertising I think in the month of April of 2020, advertising revenue dropped 40 percent. Never seen anything so precipitous in my life. Uh, it was, you know, a terrible year for us overall. And uh, and so I think podcasting and digital were a little immune from it. Uh, then I think now that they're bigger and they're more sizable, they probably have less immunity they had then. But I still think they're they're much better performers through a downturn. My, my question is, both of these elements, not having really seen it or felt it before, and then also just the danger to my business, it makes me feel very insecure. Honestly, Bob, you're a you know, seasoned, wise, wise leader. What are you insecure about in leadership today? You know what? What am I insecure about? I guess I'm insecure about what I don't know. But I think at this point, you know, the, the beauty of being old is that you get really comfortable with all of this. And I probably am not as passionate or as fiendish as I just like maniacal as I was when I was younger. But I'm also a lot more chill. When people have a bad crisis, I always say, look, guys, you know, enjoy this one. Because when we get the next crisis, you'll wish you had this one back. Um, I mean, we'll get through them. It just, uh, you know, it's not getting all worked up and going to help us solve it any better. Some of it's within our control. Some of it's not. And uh, it's just a matter of trying to figure out, okay, whatever it is. What is it? Let's diagnose it. And then let's do all we can to to respond to that diagnostics. But I think very important on this stuff is to diagnose it correctly. Bob, you've been very successful in your career. When you think about your relationship to money, how do you think about and describe your relationship to money today? Yeah, look, I have never in my life, I'll take that back. I took one job in my life for money. Uh, every other job I've taken because it just sounded like great fun. And it was a grand adventure. And I happen to make some places more than others, a lot of money, or at least a lot of money for me. I've never chased money. I've never worshipped money. Uh, I don't think money ever defines me. Uh, I am try to be very careful that I don't hang out with just people who also have money, uh, but that I also have a great variety of friends and that keep me grounded in what's really going on in the world and give me an interesting life. And uh, I think, you know, money, money doesn't give you happiness at all. Uh, if you don't have a certain amount of money, you might not be happy, but above a certain amount. And it's like when I tell kids about, you know, give them career advice, I go, look, you're going to spend more time at work than you are spending the money you make at work. So do something you love to do and uh, find something that you can't wait to get to work in the morning. And at the end of the day, you're sad you have to put it away. And when you're not working, you're thinking about it and it's challenging to you and it satisfies your curiosity. And then as long as you make enough money and pay the bills, um, you're a winner. And, you know, sometimes you get lucky and make a whole lot of money. It's usually luck. It's usually accidental um, unless you go into finance. Um, but it's uh, that's sort of the, the game we play. And by the way, if you do happen to make a lot of money, then be generous with the people who didn't make a lot of money 
and provide for a lot of other things that help the world. How do you think about bringing up, you know, you have three children. How do you think about bringing up your children uh, who have, you know, more money than maybe you did growing up um, and make sure that they have that humility and hard work ethic despite having money in childhood? You know what? I, I think it's hard. Um, I think it's hard to have the total influence on your kids. I think you can be an advisor. I think you can set a tone. Um, I, I think, you know, you go through a period from sort of 15, 16 to sort of mid to late twenties in which I'm an idiot. Um, and then, but some of the things I told them later in life, they go, you know, I remember you told me that and that's, you know, so, but it's later on, but they have to build their own life. And I think the hardest problem, uh, that we have as parents is not to do too much. Um, I let them find it. I, what worries me to death about the world today is when I grew up, I would go outside and I would get on my bike. My mother had no idea where I was. Uh, she didn't know who I was with. She said, be home by dinner. I would be home. They called it supper then. Be home by supper. I was home by supper. And, uh, and she had no idea. When I moved away from Mississippi when I was 18, I moved to Milwaukee. My parents had no idea what was going on in Milwaukee. There was no information source from Milwaukee unless they subscribed to a newspaper, which would come probably a week later. Um, the long distance phone calls were very expensive. So we talked once every couple of weeks and I saw them in person once or twice a year. And, uh, so I was completely independent and I was able to build me. I, I worry about my kids and I try to resist this temptation, but I have them on the, you know, the friend finder. I know where they are at all times. Uh, I text with them constantly every day running, you know, a running family text, um, I see them all the time. We fly everywhere together. It's like, how are they going to build their true independence? How are they going to be independent from me? Forget money, but independent from me in terms of their own thinking and their own, who do they want to be? And I think they're, I look at, I've got three kids. All of them have very different personalities. All of them want to do different things. And what I really hope for them is they do that. And I, I try not to give them advice because my parents used to tell me, they go, why don't you get out of that radio business? You're just wasting your time. Just finish college. Cause I was going to college and on the radio and they would go just, and then I, I moved to the next job and say, why did you leave them? They were so nice to you. And, and, you know, don't you feel bad about, and then when I was about 30, my parents go, God, I sure am glad you didn't listen to us. Um, and, and I remember that as a great parental lesson is don't listen to me. Uh, listen to yourself. And the only thing I would ask you, have you examined it well? Have you thought it through? And if you've thought it through, whatever decision you come up with, I'm supportive. I'm, 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 I'm behind you. I want you to do what you want to do to build you. If you know your children are making a mistake, do you let them make it anyway? Because How do you know what's a mistake? I mean, obviously, so if you're getting ready to step in front of a car, I'll pull them back. But things that look like mistakes often turn out to be brilliant ideas. And uh, who knows? And I'm, I, I, I want to be careful that I'm not imposing my judgment of mistake on them, but rather I let them decide for themselves what's right, what's wrong. And, uh, you know, if I, if I thought my killed, kids were going to commit murder or something, I would probably step in. But <laughs> beyond that, I, I think they've got to discover it. And, you know, and they're going to have problems in life. But I can't solve their problems for them. I can support them and I can be for, there for them. And I can be a sounding board. And the less judgmental I am, the more they'll use me as a sounding board. And the more judgmental I am, the less they want to use me as a sounding board because I'm not a sounding board anymore. I'm a controller. Final one, I promise you, and then we'll do a quick fire. I, I love children and I, I want to have children, but I also work my fucking ass off and I'm terrified about losing any inch on performance. How do you think about being there for your children in the way that you want to be, but also being a rock star CEO and bluntly leading hundreds and thousands of people. I, I, I retired once in my life when my little kids were young and took about eight years as just sort of an investor, part-time investor. And uh, I'm a pilot. So I flew all around the world. I had them in 50 countries by the time they were 10. I, I fed my curiosity and fed them and hopefully helped them develop some of theirs. Um, but I believe in, I, I think life work balance is hard. I think life work integration is easier. Uh, and it's a matter of how we all sort of, you know, do it together. I wouldn't hold myself up as being the greatest parent in the world. I try as hard as anyone does, but boy, is it hard work. 
And I think when you get to kids, you don't do the kids for you. You do the kids for them. And you do, you're ready. I'm willing to, just like I want to contribute some of my money to charities, which are important and help them. I want to give the world some more human beings that I think are good human beings that I helped raise. But it's work. It's a lot of work. And it's a commitment. And uh, and I love every minute of it. I adore them. But it is, uh, and I learn a lot. I learned as much from them as they, they as they learn from me. And, you know, you ask me, how do you keep in touch with ideas, et cetera? Is my kids open, open the world to me? Ideas they have and interests they have, I would have never had. Their ideas would have never occurred to me. And if I listen to them, I go, I, I got, they gave me something. And often their, their critique of my behavior, their critique of my clothing, their critique of my businesses, there's often a real something to the idea, even when they were very young kids. Final, final one, I promise. What's the hardest part of being a parent? Control, loss of control. Uh, that hardest part of being a parent is you can't will things to happen. Even if you work really, really hard, even if you spend every penny you have, you can't guarantee outcomes. That this is, it's scary. Uh, it's scary to be in that position. And, but at the same time, it's very rewarding. Bob, I'm going to move into a quick fire round. Otherwise, I'm going to take all of your day. Um, I say a short statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? Fine, let's go. So what's your favorite memory from the MTV journey? Probably the best journey or the best memory was when we did a meeting with Steve Ross, who is the CEO of Warner Communications, and Jim Robinson, who is the CEO of American Express. And we had to ask them if we could do the idea. And they said, yes. So that has to be the best idea, or the best moment uh, in, the, in, in all of MTV. What's the best concert you've ever been to and why them? It's either the first iHeartRadio music festival uh, that we did in Vegas when we used it originally just to launch the app. That was the way we were going to get the iHeartRadio app as to do the iHeartRadio music festival. And then it was such a hit. We do it every year. And the other one was Live Aid. And I sort of modeled the iHeartRadio Music Festival on Live Aid because it was this great collaboration of musicians, so many musicians sharing one stage. And in the case of, of Live Aid, we had uh, the UK and the US, and only one musician played both, Phil Collins, took the Concord. Um, and, uh, and the iHeartRadio Music Festival, we do two nights, one stage. But I think having musicians on one stage together and by the way, when you go backstage and they're all sort of chatting and seeing each other, meeting people, it's great. And Paul McCartney, when he played at the IR Radio Music Festival, backstage he said, you know, could I go out front and, and, and watch? Said, I, I never get a chance to really see concerts. And we took him out front, put some security people around him, and he got to sit in the stands and watch the other people perform. And so I think it does something for both the music, the musicians, and us, as well as the consumer. I love that. Who's the best board member you've sat on a board with and why? God, that would be too hard. I couldn't, I couldn't say that because then I would be uh, shortchanging all of them because I think almost every person I've sat on a board with, I've learned something from and, uh, and continue to sort of use lessons I learned from them. Wow. We sit on very different boards. Um, <laughs> what do you want your legacy to be, Bob? I, and I don't believe in legacy. I don't think any legacy. I don't think there is a legacy. Uh, you know, it's funny. I worked for Steve Ross, who was took his father-in-law's two funeral homes, turned it into Time Warner. Couldn't have been a greater entrepreneur. I say people today, Steve Ross, and they go, the guy who owns the Miami Dolphins. I go, no, no, not that Steve Ross. Or I go, Lou Wasserman. They don't know who Lou Wasserman is. They don't know who Bill Paley is. He started CBS. There are no legacies. Uh, unless you put your name on a building and then they think you are the building, uh, but have no idea who you are. Um, they, they, legacies don't matter. I mean, you should do what you want to do. And I think anybody who's trying to build something for legacy is kidding themselves. What's your biggest lesson from the Casa Dragones journey? God, there are so many of them. Uh, one is that passion really does matter. Uh, two is that it's possible to let, because I'm in the business of using, I got to grow fast. In every business I'm in. And Casa Dragones, we said, we're going to let it grow at whatever pace it grows because we want it to be authentic and we want it to just roll out in a way that, that we own the, the tequila connoisseur. And so, and, and we let it go. And that, that was hard for me because that's so different from me as normal business person. Uh, but we had the luxury to do it. And, and for me, Casa Drugs was great because my, my thought was I, it was a win-win. 
I either have a successful business or have all the tequila I ever need for the rest of my life. <laughs> I love that. Uh, penultimate one, what consumer habit are you most excited about today? You know, that's an interesting one. I think it's, uh, I think it's probably, uh, I mean, the consumer habit's the same, which is convenience. I think uh, the ability of, to reach the consumer quickly and to get a, a retail response from a reaction quickly has been great, but I'm not sure the consumer and behavior has changed much. It expresses itself differently when they're watching this screen than they're watching NBC, but at the heart of it, it's still the same desires. Final one for you, Bob. Five years time, we're going to do another show. It's going to be 2027. Um, where will you be then? I hope I'll be alive. <laughs> I mean, you are the only person to have given me that response. Bob, I cannot thank you enough. Honestly, I've so loved doing this show. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And congratulations on the show. And thanks for having me on.